So the situation we are looking at here is one where we have two random variables, x and y. They all come along with their own properties, like the expected value of x and the variance of x, and equally the expected value of y and the variance of y. And we have a new random variable, v, which is a linear combination of these two. So that new random variable v is some sort of function of the properties of x and y. Importantly here to understand is that these terms a, b and c, they are not random variables, they are constants. The task we want to tackle now is to figure out how can we calculate the particular property, the expected value of y, so uh, sorry, the expected value of v, how can we calculate that, hopefully as a function of these two values, expected value of x and expected value of y. As it turns out, to calculate the expected value of v, we don't need the variance of either x or y, or even the covariance of the two. If we are after the expected value of v, all we require is the expected value of x and the expected value of y. But from just the situation as we face it right now, it's perhaps not so obvious that there is an easy way to calculate the expected value of v as a function of the expected value of x and y. So this is what we will do in this video. We will establish that indeed there is this easy way. It requires a bit of algebra and thinking, but once we know how to do it, we will not have to go through this algebra anymore. Now, if we have a random variable, v, and we want to calculate the expected value from first principles, what we need to do is we need to take the possible values, all possible values, so a times little a x plus b times little y plus c, and we have to calculate that for all possible combinations of x and y, and multiply that with the probability of this possible combination of x and y. So for a moment, let's look over this table over here. Let's consider x, both x and y are um, discrete random variables. So we can think of summations and not of integrations. And let's say x has possible outcomes 1, 2, up to n x. So that could be any value. Let's say it's 5, okay, but it doesn't have to be 5. And y has outcomes 1, 2, up to n y. could be any possible n y. Let's say it's 4 for the argument, for argument's sake. Okay, but it's, well, valid generically. So if we have that, then there will be 20 possible outcomes, 5 times 4 possible outcomes. And if each of them will have their own probability. So that last probability here will be a probability 5,4, that x is 5 and y is 4. And of course, if this is a joint probability distribution, they have to sum to 1. So what we need to do to calculate this expected value of v, we need to sum this term, the possible outcome, times the probability over all these 20 values. If we have two random variables, we usually write that using a double index, a double summation. Okay, So we're summing over all x's, so that may be i equals 1 to nx, whatever that nx x is, and then j, another index, from 1 to ny. To make the notation a little easier, we often don't write these indi indices, but we just write over all x and over all y. That's what this means. Okay, so this is how we would calculate the expected value from first principles for this discrete random variable v. But we know it's a function of these random variables x and y, and wouldn't it be nice if this simplifies into a nice formula that only involves ex and ey? So, the first trick we're going to do here is the following. You see we have a sum, in fact a double sum, of a sum. Okay, here we have ax plus by plus c times that probability. You could also think about ax times that probability 
plus b y times that probability plus c times that probability. So we'll decompose that one double sum into actually three double sums. On first sight, that may look more complicated, but it will simplify our life p of x y. So this is now that times that plus the next double sum. So again, we are summing over all x and all y of b y times the joint probability of PXY plus, so that's now that times that, plus the third, that again we're having that double sum, not very nice summation signs, I'm sorry, of C times that joint probability. So now we're having three terms. And let's give them uh, names because we'll think about them separately. Let's call that A. Let's call that one here B. And that last one we'll call it C or we'll don't even give it a name. We think immediately about it because here is the easiest thing. Let's think about just this term here. Recall that that C is a constant and we know we can if we have a constant factor inside a, um, uh, a summation then we can bring that outside so that is going to be the same as c times the double sum of all x and all y of the probability of x and y this bit here is the sum of all these probabilities. Okay, we are summing, we're fixing the first x and then summing over all y. So we're summing down here that first column. Then go to the next x and then we sum over that second column, then over the third column, and then we sum over all columns. We sum all these joint probabilities and what do we get? One, of course, because this is a probability distribution and all the probabilities sum to one. So we get a C here. That green term simplifies to a C. So success, first success in simplification. Now what about that term A? Let's think about that term A. Let's copy it first. Oops. Slightly nicer summation signs. So summing over all X and all Y. A times X times the probability, joint probability of x and y. So the first easy win is the same trick as we did before with the c. That a is just a constant term. So we can just bring it outside the summation. Summing of all x and y of x times p x comma y. So, the next step is perhaps the most difficult one to understand. And for that, let me just draw another little table that mirrors the structure of this joint probability table. So we're having all the x's, one, two, and so forth. We're having all the y's, one, two, all the way to n, y. And here we go to n, x. So, in that table, in red numbers, I will now write the value x as we go through that table. What is the x value? Well, everywhere here in that first column, the value of x is 1. Everywhere here in that second column, the value of x is 2. So we're sort of ignoring the white value, y value because we're only looking at x here and so forth. So then what you need to understand is that we can sort of look at just this inner summation. What does this inner summation do? It basically says, okay, from the outer summation we get, for instance, we start with the first x value, that's one, get x equals one, and then we sum over x times the probability 
xy, but over all y values. So we're basically going down here, all the y values. We are summing x times the joint probability, so all of these values, times the joint probability, all of these values. That's what this inner sum does. Now, in that inner sum, x remains constant. So, really, for that inner sum, x is a constant. And what can we do with constants in additions? We can bring them outside the summation. So what we get here is a times the sum of x. And then we brought that x outside of that inner summation. So x times the sum of, that's over the y's, the joint probability x, y. So, have we really gained anything here? This just looks just as complicated as first. Now the real magic is happening. Because see what we have here. The sum of all joint probabilities for a given y. Oh, sorry, for a given x over all y. So what does that mean? That is just the sum of all these numbers. For instance, for x equals 1, it's the sum of all these numbers. And what do we get? If we calculate that, I've just, I haven't left myself enough space, I just need to get rid of this. What do we get? We get the probability that x is equals to 1, a marginal probability. And if we move to the next x, say x equals 2, then what this inner sum will do is it will calculate the sum of all these probabilities. We get the probability that x is equals to 2. So what this sum here is, it is just the marginal probability of whatever x we have in that loop. So what we get is a times the sum over all x times x times the marginal probability. So this bit here which is the marginal probability of x, because we're summing these probabilities. So, what can we gain now? What is this? The sum over all x of x times px. Now that is a familiar look, because that is just the expected value of x. That's brilliant, because now we have learned that that first term here simplifies from its very complicating, complicated look to a times the expected value of x. What about the second term? That b term. Well, really, it works in exactly the same way. We we'll just need one little trick at the beginning. So the double sum over all x and all y of b times y times probability of x comma y, so the joint probability. So you see how the double sum, let me switch back to red, how this red double sum was organized. It said we fix the first x value and then we sum over all y. So that's why we went down these columns. Okay, we then went down the columns. And what are we doing? Why do we have this double sum? Because we really just needed to add up all the, in our little case, if you have five and four outcomes, 20 values here, or the nx times ny outcomes. And we can either sum for like column wise, but we could also, if we wanted to, sum up row wise. And we also get the sum. Okay, and if we want to sum up row wise, all we got to do is we got to switch these summation signs around. So we're summing over all y and all x. Nothing really changes. It's just the order of our summation which changes. And now you can follow exactly the same argument as up here for a with the outcome that this term simplifies to b times 
the expected value of y. And the argument will be exactly the same as for term as for term a. So we've established that that second term simplifies to b times the expected value of y. And then we have that third term, let me just add it here properly, plus c that was cut from that green term. So what have we established? What have we gained here? We basically illustrated that if we have a random variable v, which is a linear combination as described here of random variables x and y, then in order to calculate the expected value of v, all we got to do is take the same linear combination of the expected values. And that is of course much easier than having to go through this whole double summation. If you already have the expected values of x and y, you just calculate a times expected value of x plus b times expected value of y plus c.